This is Albemarle Street in London, the city's first one-way street. Halfway along this street is the Royal Institution. And here in the 1800s and early 1900s, artists, poets, and scientists would engage with the public. Scientists would tell stories of their latest works and give live demonstrations of their latest discoveries. And the rich and wealthy from all over London would come and listen and see the wonder of science. In fact, such was the demand to get to these talks and such was the crowds of horse-drawn carriages descending on Albemarle Street that the Royal Institution had to make the street one way in order to avoid complete traffic chaos. Scientists were the hottest ticket in town. And for a time, there was a tangible connection between scientists and the public. But times change. Science is constantly changing. A new theory replaces an old one. A new knowledge fills a gap. And how scientists communicate also changed. Scientists began to spend more time researching and less time engaging with the public. More time became most and then most became almost all. And gradually, the connection between scientists and the public weakened. And this is complicated by three barriers to science communication. The first is the language of science. It is objective. It has to be. It is complex to be clear. But this complexity and objectivity of scientific language means it's difficult for the public to care about it because it sounds cold and convoluted. And I'm a PhD student in science, and a few weeks ago, I was working on a draft paper with my supervisor, and we were sending the drafts back and forth to each other, but he kept on pulling me up on areas where my scientific writing wasn't of a good enough standard, where I was being ambiguous, where I wasn't being clear enough, not giving enough detail, or where there was room for interpretation of what I was saying. There can never be room for interpretation for a scientist as they write because that's how mistakes are made. And at the end of the week, I was absolutely wrecked, and I also remembered that I actually hadn't been in contact with my girlfriend for an entire week, so I said, um, I better send her an email, and it, it started off okay, and the first thing I wanted to tell her was that I wanted to tell her that um, I wanted to apologize for not having been in contact all week, but it just, it didn't come out quite as I, <laughs> quite as I wanted, and, and then the next thing is I wanted to, I wanted to tell her how, how beautiful her eyes were, but that I was kind of a bit afraid of her dad. And again, that didn't, that didn't come out as I wanted to. <laughs> then <clears throat> I wanted to reassure her that I, wanted to, that I wanted to hold her and that I would never let her go, but it just came out <laughs> completely, completely wrong. After that then, I've, I wanted to tell her that we had a strong bond, one that I hoped would come strong in the future, and then I just, I wish that she would feel the same way as me, but again, that just came out a little bit, a little bit askew. And then I signed off like this. <laughs> now, my girlfriend, she's not a scientist, and she calls things as she sees them, so this was her reply. So this was me communicating as a scientist, and I was unable to step away from the objective language and its complex nature. And as a love letter, it was completely useless because there was no emotional connection, and I was about as romantic as a block of cheese. So this is one of the ways that there is a barrier between how scientists communicate to each other and how they communicate to the public. The second barrier is that of context. When I hear the word model, this is what I think of. <laughs> That's a model. That's an idealized representation of a process. But to everyone else, well, that's a model. And when I hear the word significant, I think of statistically significant. I think of a p-value less than 0 0.05. <laughs> and I think of a difference in results that are beyond chance. To me, this is significant. But to everyone else, this is significant. 
So that clash of context can also prevent scientists from communicating effectively with the public. And the last barrier is the amount of detail that we use as scientists. We need to use an awful lot of detail because we need to make sure that other scientists can replicate our work. And I was at a conference a few weeks ago and one of the slides that went up was like this and it was just packed full of detail. Now, I like detail. <laughs> but even I couldn't handle all of this detail. And in fact, I only got as far as the heading and then after the heading, I just basically wanted to have a look around to see who else was at this talk because that was more important. And then, and then after that, well, I realized, you know, I better check my phone to see what's happening on Facebook, like, you know, see if I actually, see if I actually have any friends. Um, then after that, I realized I was absolutely starving because I hadn't eaten all day. And, you know, I reckoned it was a really nice hotel where the conference is on, so I figured they'd probably have some really nice food at the coffee break. And then I began to wonder, which would I rather fight, 50 duck-sized horses or one horse-sized duck? <laughs> And the biggest thing that I actually got out of that slide on the introduction to wetlands was to research this fight when I got home. <laughs> Instead of actually learning anything about wetlands, all I could think of was this big, massive <laughs> duck. So this is another barrier between how scientists can communicate effectively with the public. And a few weeks ago, I found myself going over to a science communication competition where I would have to connect with scientists and the public at the same time. I would have to make sure that I got in enough scientific information but that I didn't lose the attention and the understanding of the audience. I would have to do all of this without PowerPoint and in three minutes, no more. But I had in my head that communicating science to scientists and communicating science to the public are completely different languages. And how was I going to do this properly? Because all of my training had been in one language, the language of science. How was I going to speak the language of the people? And I needed to change. And I needed a tool to help me change. A tool that would allow me to connect with the audience. A tool to connect the scientist with the public. And I thought about it, and I remember that when I was a child, I loved stories. I could listen to the same story again and again and again every day and never get sick of it. And I would al always have an emotional connection with the storyteller. And I didn't realize that that was the tool that I needed. That I would tell a story and embed the science within the story. So I decided to tell a story. <laughs> How clear is the line between life and death? Everyone here has something in common, a beating heart which keeps us alive. If your heart stopped beating, that would be cardiac arrest, leading to death. But what if you didn't need a beating heart to be alive? Well, to answer this question, we must go on a journey, all the way to the forests of northern Canada. Now, this isn't a story of fantasy or fairy tale. It does, however, involve a frog, the wood frog, and each winter, the wood frog blurs the line between life and death. Unlike us, frogs are cold-blooded. Their body temperature closely follows the temperature of their environment. Now, seeing as the wood frog lives in such a cold environment, this presents a problem. But the wood frog has evolved a solution to live with the cold. Like Bear Grylls, the wood frog is tough. <laughs> but unlike Bear Grylls, it's tough in real life. As the temperature drops below zero, the frog begins to freeze. First its legs freeze, then its head and chest freeze, until finally its heart freezes. No heartbeat, no pulse. It's in cardiac arrest. And it stays in this death-like state for weeks. Now, during these weeks, the frogs are just like ice cubes. If you drop them on the ground, they just clink around. And in fact, they're so cold that they don't even respond to a kiss from a princess. But during the spring, something incredible happens. The frog begins to thaw out. Its heart starts to beat again. Its lungs start to breathe again until finally they're hopping around. But how can the wood frog cheat death like this? And why can't we survive freezing and thawing?
Well, when the cells in our body freeze, they dehydrate. Water leaves the cell and freezes in the area around the cell. But with no water left on the inside anymore, the cells collapse, split, and die. And can never regain their function. But the wood frog is different. It has an inbuilt safety mechanism. As its cells begin to freeze, some water leaves, but it is replaced with glucose, which is a simple sugar that the frog makes as it freezes. This glucose combines with the remaining water inside the cell, keeping the inside unfrozen. So while all around the cell is frozen, the inside is protected in this natural sugary antifreeze. So clearly the wood frog won't be going off sugar for Lent. <laughs> then, when the frog thaws out, water re-enters the cell, the glucose leaves, and the cells resume their function. And this freeze-thaw adaptation allows the wood frog to survive, not by avoiding the cold, but by embracing it. And it challenges our understanding of what it is to be alive, with a beating heart. And that's how the wood frog blurs the line between life and death, not by freezing to death, but by freezing to live. And I found that telling a scientific story was a big change for me, a big departure from the way that I was used to communicating. But it allowed me to overcome the barriers of effective science communication. I could overcome the barrier of objective language by using emotional terms and talking about emotional things like life and death, yet getting in all of the science of the cells I could overcome the barrier of context because the context was the story of the frog. And I could present all of the details in a way that was familiar to the public. A simple beginning, middle and end story of survival. Stories are powerful tools. They enrapture, they captivate, they lead to a smile, a glint, a tear, a shiver. They emotionally connect. And the connection is key. If we, as scientists, cannot connect with the public, it is very difficult for the public to care about what we do. And if they don't care about what they do, it is even harder for them to understand. This needs to change. For scientists to reconnect with the public, we must not be afraid to use the simple language of storytelling. Because simple language does not mean simple thinking. And to reconnect, we use the oldest communication tools that we have. The voice, the ear, and the story. Thank you very much.